Welcome everyone. I'm Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX and delighted to be moderating this session today. And in fact, like many of you watching and seeing that video, I wish I were in Japan too. Um, and this session hopefully one day will come back uh, live and in person, but this is not a bad substitute. Uh, and in fact, that's really what we're here to talk about, how our lives and events like this have changed so dramatically during the pandemic, how much has moved digitally, virtually, and how do you tax that appropriately? This is not an academic conversation. This is a very real, live, immediate discussion that's have, that has practical implications today for governments and for companies and for consumers all over the world. So I'm really delighted the World Economic Forum has brought the conversation to this summit and brought together such an incredible group of panelists to have this discussion. Uh, let me just tell you who's here and then we'll, we'll dive into the, into the conversation. Um, we have Cedric O, who is the Minister of State for the Digital Transition and Electronic Communication of France. Welcome, Cedric. We have Josh Calmer, who's the Head of Global Public Policy and Government Relations at Zoom. Barbara Angus, the Global Tax Policy Leader at EY. And Sharon Burrow, the General Secretary for the International Trade Union Confederation. Uh, this is a group of panelists joining us from all over the world, which we can do because we're virtual. Uh, but governments around the world have said, look, so much of the economy is moving virtually. How do we appropriately tax this? The OECD is actively working to create a unified approach to it. They, they say maybe by the summer, by June, there will be such an approach. But before we get there, many governments have said, we're not going to wait. And there are digital services taxes, so-called DSTs, coming online in many, many places, others being debated in other countries. There's pushback. The Biden administration just announced they want to put forward tariffs. I think I've valued at about a, a billion dollars on a number of countries that have these, these digital services taxes. So this is, as I, as I said, a very live, active debate. And I, and I want to begin with, with the Minister of State, with Cedric, if we can, uh, because your government and you personally have been so active in this debate. And just to get a sense from you of, of why, why are you pursuing an agenda of digital taxation? Why do you think it's important to do? Well, thank you uh, first for having me today. Um, and I, I do think that the debate that we are having today <clears throat> is very important, both from an economic point of view, but also from a democratic point of view. Well, you, you mentioned the, the high speed digit digitalization rate of the economy and the fact that uh, uh, for some specific players, which are highly digitalized, they have been reshuffling the way uh, value chain are, are working, the way the value is created and distributed uh, within the country that they operated, they operate in, and they have been putting into pressure um, the, the the original principle uh, on which a taxation was based, which was that you were paying tax for uh, public services, uh, especially uh, in the countries where the value was uh, created and where um, the service wa was provided. Due to the, uh, the, the way the digital economy is working, um, this, those principles has, have been uh, uh, squeezed by, uh, uh, by the digitalization of the economy and by especially some uh, very important stakeholders which, has, which are uh, highly digitalized. On the same time, we have seen with the COVID-19 pandemic that the question of uh, financing the pub public services, uh, financing uh, healthcare system and so on, is something that we have to take care of. Um, and this is why France has been advocating, but with uh, many other countries and, and the uh, European Union especially, to create or to reset uh, the principles on which uh, our taxation, uh, international taxation system uh, is, uh, is working. Obviously, and you, you mentioned it, uh, since we're talking about something that is uh, basically international, the, the, the solution should be multilateral. We need to find a multilateral uh, solution. This is why we have been backing for many years now a, a solution uh, at first at the OECD uh, level, if not at uh, the European uh, the European level. But what we cannot condone is the fact that there is a huge democratic pressure on those questions of uh, uh, sharing the value on, or, on, uh, on the taxation. This is why some countries in the meantime, uh, until we are able to find a solution at the international level, have decided, decided to take 
uh, the, uh, uh, the initiative. France is one of them, but this is not uh, the only one. And if you like, look at the, the multiplication of the countries that are taking initiative at that point, that will give a hint, uh, uh, give you a hint on, uh, on the democratic pressure that is existing within sure. those countries. So what we said is that we would take the, the initiative, but that there would be a sunset clause to, to some extent. The day there is an international solution, we hope at the OECD level, and we noticed uh, very positively the, the latest uh, declaration of the United States, it would replace the French taxation. Well, as you say, you know, people do want this. I mean, some taxes are unpopular, but depending on the country and on the, on the population, there are many people who would be supportive, I think, and see this as a political positive to put forward taxation on digital services, especially when you think of how concentrated the global digital economy is among a, a few major players, how many of them are based in the United States. And even before we got to this point, um, there are so many companies, major corporations that pay less tax than many governments think that they should and have moved around the world uh, in order to find the best places to, to be taxed. So I guess maybe we can bring in Josh into this discussion. This is very meta in a way, Josh. I'm talking to you on Zoom, you work at Zoom, and we're talking about taxing companies like Zoom. Uh, how, do you, how do you think we should think about a digital services tax? What, would, what impact would it have on Zoom, on consumers who use your product? And, and I mean, can't you understand the sort of direction the minister's going as well, saying, hey, we need revenue for our health system and our education system, and we can't just wait forever. We need to get to uh, the point of a, a reasonable tax on companies like yours. Yeah, th thanks, Raj. Um, minister O makes a, a lot of really uh, important points, and I say this in my capacity of my current role with Zoom, but also my prior one representing the, the global tech sector as a whole. Uh, you know, some of the points he made, and it was evident in the introduction to this, are just that the world's changed unimaginably over the last 20 years. Uh, the extent to which services are being provided digitally across borders is, is remarkable, and it is absolutely the case that the, the notion of permanent establishment, the notion of a physical place of business as sort of being the, uh, the, the anchor for allocating taxing rights has um, lost some of its utility. It's still an important concept. It's still a, an important fixture in the set of international tax norms. But um, the, I think that there, there's certainly an appreciation within Zoom and I think uh, across the global tech sector as a whole that, that digitization has legitimately changed the playing field and that governments have legitimate uh, questions about how to respond. Uh, from our perspective, the important things are, are twofold. Number one, that we look at digitization as a whole. Uh, certainly, there are some companies that are very significant players. Sometimes Zoom is included in that bucket. Sometimes it's not. Um, but, but we're dealing here with a larger phenomenon where it's not just internet platforms, but services companies of all kinds providing services across borders digitally often with no physical place of business. And so the, the phenomenon goes beyond uh, a small group of admittedly very important countries. The, the, the second point is that it really does have to be multilateral. And, and I commend Minister O and Minister Le Maire and the French government for, for their leadership uh, in the OECD. This is, um, if there were ever an issue that was just fundamentally international, where the, the cross-border inter interdependence was so undeniable, it's this, because ultimately, whether you're looking at revenue or whether you're looking at income, there's a fixed amount of money <laughs> in the world that is the subject of this discussion. And we have to have a principled, coherent, consistent way to determine how to allocate tax and rights with respect to that. It's, and it's not just the global tax system that's at stake. It's really the, the concept of multilateralism, the concept of cooperating together as the, as the Japanese government said so well to, to meet the challenges that we all face now. There is some danger in this though, right? And Sharon, I want to bring you into the discussion. There's some danger that until we get to a unified multilateral agreement, and maybe it takes a lot longer than is expected, that countries will you know, race to do what their populations want, add new taxes, create complexity, create barriers, slow down the innovation, make this more difficult. Um, do, you, do you worry about that as someone who I think believes in a digital services tax? Talk to us about, how, about why you think such a tax is important and how do, how do you think of this issue that potentially there are going to be some unforeseen consequences if we go down this road? 
Well, we have to have a multilateral approach. There's no doubt about that. And the minister and uh, others will make that point, I'm sure. If you look at the current situation, it's fair to no one. It's not fair on a competitive basis for companies who operate in the commodities world. It's also, or the product world, it's not fair for those companies operating in grey, for the, sorry, the governments who are seeing tax revenue fall, where companies increasingly operate in a grey zone by suggesting their product uh, uh, are really services and digital services at that. And it's absolutely not fair to individuals who depend on their governments for, um, in this current context, recovery, building recovery and resilience, but also for those essential public services, universal social protection. Ultimately, business can't operate in this uncompetitive space, nor can democracies regain or contain and regain trust of citizens. So we must have a digital uh, tax. At the moment, we absolutely support the OECD tax agenda, particularly Pillar 2, which would go a good part of the way by making a universal base, 25%, we would hope, for corporate taxation. And there's some hope with the US just having raised its tax base to 28% for corporations that this might um, actually come to fruition. At the moment, most corporations uh, or their advocates are arguing a much uh, lower rate. But that will be played out at the G20 and we absolutely support and think that the policy setting, minus perhaps the rate, is actually ready uh, to implement by agreement. However, on the digital, the, the taxing of digital services, but digitalization broadly, then we are still seeing pillar one as not having enough ambition and as being too complex. We hear people talk about the complexities of uh, double taxation, but we have to get the mechanism right. And so I understand and we support countries who are acting in the interests of their own citizens um, absent a global approach, but in the end, we have to have a global approach. It's that simple. But you can't have a loss. You know, already we've got something like a $400 billion tax loss through tax evasion in OECD countries alone, let alone what it would mean if we we're able to have the kind of shared, uh, 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 you know, sort of fundraising capacity of, of taxes, fair taxation indeed to help developing countries. So it is urgent, but we must get it right. Thanks for that, Sharon. Barbara, I'd love to get your take on this for, for the people following along. You know, we've introduced you as a senior advisor in global tax policy at EY. You were until recently the chief tax counsel on the House Ways and Means Committee, had a long history working on Capitol Hill as an expert on tax policy. So thinking about that kind of bigger picture view you're able to bring to this discussion, Sharon mentioned that yeah, this is this is one part of a broader theme of many global companies not paying sufficient taxes according to their own governments where they're based, people shopping around for the best, best tax environment. A his, there's a long history of countries competing against each other using tax policy. Do you think it's possible that we can get to a true multilateral digital services tax where everyone sort of holds hands around the world and this really works? Or what do you think is the likely scenario for how this will play out? Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to be a part of this important um, um, dialogue on, on a really um, timely topic. The, the, um, I, I guess I will start by joining the chorus for a multilateral approach. I think that's critically important. I also think it's important to maybe to step back and talk a little bit about the difference between the, 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 what the inclusive framework is working on um, and what a digital services tax looks like, because they are very different approaches to digital tax. The inclusive framework proposal and its pillar one of the, of the OECD G20 project uh, is, is, um, ha has at its core the, 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 the traditional architecture of the international tax system, and it involves efforts to make fundamental changes to, to that historic um, architecture. 
it is centered on countries' corporate income taxes, and it, and it contemplates changes in how taxing rights over global business income are shared among countries by, with, with the aim of allocating a greater share of income to the country where the market or customer exists, greater than the traditional principles um, would, would have allocated, but it, but it builds on and supplements those traditional principles. And it really involves two of the, the major building blocks of the, of the international tax system. One is the concept of nexus. When, when, does, when does a business have a sufficient connection to a country to, to fall within its taxing net? Uh, and that traditional concept has been um, permanent establishment, which has a focus on physical presence. Uh, and, this, um, and, and this effort would, would supplement that um, and create a situation of taxable nexus where there was no, where there is no physical presence. Uh, the second, the second of the building blocks is the is the is the is, the, uh, is on the allocation side. Um, how to determine um, in a in a complex global value value chain where where value was where value was created and how much value was created in each location, uh, and and this um, in in this. Um, aspect that the effort seeks to supplement the, the traditional approach of arm's length, uh, the arm's length principle by adopting a, a somewhat more formulaic approach um, aimed at, at allocating a portion of these profits to the, to the place where there is, where there is nexus. It, 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 and the object is a coordinated approach to ensure that there isn't double or multiple taxation, which would be a real barrier to, to global activity. On the other hand, digital services taxes are taxes on gross income or gross revenue, not on income or profits. And, and in, that, in that way, they're a blunt instrument and can apply in situations where there is no net, net profit. So, so countries have taken different approaches in defining the activity that triggers a DST. And, and that means there are circumstances where the same revenue could be subject to multiple DSTs. Um, it, it, it's also important, I think, to note that the, that the inclusive framework proposal isn't limited solely to digital business activity, uh, but also would allocate more taxing rights to the market country in the case of consumer facing businesses that are not digital. And, and so that's another difference between the two. Bo both of these, both the inclusive framework proposal and, and the digital services taxes we've seen adopted have, um, have roots in a, in a European Commission proposal from five or six years ago that paired the two, um, um, contemplating a digital services tax as a temporary measure um, that would be in place only while the coordinated corporate income tax-based approach, the less blunt instrument, was, was being developed. And, and I think that's really what we've heard today, this focus on the need to do the work to develop the, the multilateral and coordinated approach. And of course, it does put pressure on that multilateral approach when you put forward these bio, these unilateral DSTs. It does maybe create the political pressure needed to get to a multilateral approach. Uh, Minister, oh, maybe you can jump back into the discussion. You know, I, I understand that Google, you know, in, in France, one of the ways you've approached digital services tax is to tax advertising. And I understand that Google has said recently, well, we, we're going to raise ad rates in France in response to this. And I guess I wonder how you think about this as just maybe one example of how you're going to approach your unilateral activities while at the same time working to get to a multilateral uh, in framework that works for everyone. Well, um, let, let me be quite straightforward on that question. Obviously, we, we do regret uh, Google's decision, uh, as well as we regret uh, the same kind of decisions that had, that had been taken by uh, Apple, Apple or uh, Amazon's to, to make um, their customers, be, be their uh, business customers or private customers, pay for the tax, um, which was uh, obviously not the principle of, of, what, uh, of what we did. Hopefully, uh, the, the French tax, as I mentioned, will only be a temporary one and we'll be able to, uh, uh, to reach an international agreement. But that tactical decision from those companies might be a uh, dual side, if, if I may, because um, that could bring a lot of evidence if there is no churn within their customers that they have a market power that is uh, 
justifying all the initiatives that are being taken as far as antitrust is concerned. I don't know any normally working uh, market where a company could raise its fee. I don't think that uh, Zoom would be able to raise its price with, without having a churn within its, uh, its customers because of uh, the fact that there is competition. So as you know, there is a lot of antitrust discussion, discussion those days. And if those companies are able to raise unilaterally their prices without having any impact on their customer basis, that would mean to some extent that what we are advocating for is that they have a footprint which makes them, which put them in an oligopolistic position or in a monopolistic uh, position is something that is justified and that is justifying the initiatives that are especially taken at the level of the European Union. Yeah, that's a powerful argument. And I think it does point to the fact that there's mm -hmm. multiple things happening at the same time here, right? There's a, a move to make a, a better multilateral corporate tax framework across industries, not even just digital companies. Then, of course, there's the digital environment. But then at the very top, there are a few companies, many of which are U.S.-based, which have large market presences in, in many other countries. And I think part of the, the idea here is to try to target all of these different purposes um, and, I, and I guess maybe this is a good chance to bring others into this. I really want to open up the discussion. So please feel free to, to jump in if you have a point you'd like to make. But Josh, do you have a reaction to what you heard from, from the minister, his provocative point that, look, pricing here also connects to issues of monopolistic power and uh, these things are not disconnected? Yeah, I mean, I think there, there are some very real um, competition related in the U.S. antitrust related uh, questions happening in the global economy right now in the technology sector and in other settings. And, uh, you know, I can speak from, from Zoom's point of view as, a, as still a relatively uh, small company that, that is in a, a relatively, you know, com competitive environment. We're, we're following those issues. We care about the outcomes of those uh, discussions. But I think the the, the, the question here, we all agree, I, I think, on the, the broad theme that um, the economy has changed in ways, especially through digitization, that make re-examining the global tax system appropriate. Um, but we may have some differences tactically on how to get there. And so when, when we look at the, the tax debate and we see the proliferation of unilateral measures, we can observe both from our own experience and from the experiences of, of the technology sector in particular as a whole, uh, a few challenging things happening that, that hopefully we'd all want to avoid. The first is the prospect, as Barbara mentioned, of double or multiple taxation. If you don't have uh, clear rules of the road agreed among countries that are essentially uh, you know, battling over the, the, the same uh, quantity of, of, of revenue or profits, uh, you have the very real prospect of that happening. Uh, the second, I mentioned that it's a blunt instrument when you tax revenue, right? Because that could be taxed in multiple jurisdictions at the same time. It's not just about what comes to the bottom line. Yeah, and and a lot of and this relates to another of the points, which is that uh, some of the some of the DSTs out there don't have minimum revenue thresholds. So you have small companies, many of whom do not make a profit for many years. Who potentially would be within scope and be taxed on on revenue uh, that is not part of an overall profit making, you know, effort. And so, to the extent we want to incentivize small, innovative companies entering the scene uh, all over the world, which I think we do, we have a potential penalty there. Um, a, a third point is administrability. Uh, it, it is no small feat. Uh, even for a relatively, you know, large company. Uh, let alone the largest ones, to, to sort of reposition and re-engineer their internal processes and their financial reporting approaches and everything they need to do to comply with greatly varying uh, rules from, from market to market. So there's a deadweight loss there that occurs. Uh, and then I think that the, the final point goes beyond tax and it goes to multilateralism and global cooperation more generally. I mean, as we can see, my old employer, the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, uh, has been looking at these issues closely for the last couple of years. These, these kinds of um, disputes about how to tackle uh, shared global problems when, when individual markets depart from a multilateral approach 
it affects the larger global environment as well. It, it affects trade policy. It will affect, uh, well, I won't say it will, but I, I think it has a, it's reasonable to expect that it would affect things like how we fight climate change, how, you know, truly shared problems, just like taxation that we need to be working together to address. And, and just one final point, um, this is a lot of, you know, US-based companies um, have been uh, the, the focus of this debate, but, but ultimately, if you look at the measures uh, being enacted around the world, there are you know, measures in, in Asia that are affecting European companies, it measures in you know, the, the Indian measure affecting Japanese companies and so forth. And so we all have a stake. We all wanna encourage innovation, encourage small business, encourage employment and growth in every market, but the unilateral measures really um, create challenges for us in doing so. Barbara, maybe you can pick up from there. Uh, um, what's your view of these unilateral measures? I know you, you talk quite a bit about the inclusive framework and I'd love to hear how you think we get there. What do you think about these unilateral measures as a stepping stone to a multilateral approach? Is that the right way to look at this? Well, I guess a, a couple of comments. Um, some of the digital services taxes that have been enacted were, were, were enacted with a sort of a natural sunset or a phase out or were linked to the to the work in the inclusive framework. Um, and so from that from the outset had this intention that they that they would that they would disappear when there was a coordinated solution. That's not true of all of the digital services taxes. Um, and I guess I would, I think Josh said it very well, the complexity that's involved in, in preparing for and complying with, with these taxes and managing them all around, all around the world um, is, is huge. And it's not less um, um, it, knowing that the tax may only be temporary. Um, there's also a concern about uh, when, when, you, when you put a, put a tax in place as a, as a sort of a temporary measure um, to, 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 um, to be replaced by something that's still being developed. W once that's developed, will, will in fact the, uh, the original measure be eliminated is, is, is a natural worry. Um, um, and so I, I think, and, and the, the, the nature of, of these taxes really are the, 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 the uncoordinated approach and the, the overlap and, and, and conflict are, are, I think, a real concern and create, create real barriers to, uh, to activity. Uh, and so, um, as you said earlier, they also, it also is creating significant pressure um, on the, the inclusive framework process. Uh, and the target for that, for that process is agreement on an approach, as you said, by mid-2021, potentially by the July uh, G20 finance ministers meeting. That's an ambitious target, but but there is um, significant momentum behind the project, um, and 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 the inclusive framework, despite the challenges of the pandemic, has made has made a lot of progress on the technical work related to both the, the pillar one um, approach to, to digital taxation and beyond, and also the second pillar, uh, which Sharon mentioned, the, which involves the establishment of a global minimum tax system. And, and is not directly connected to digital taxation. The, the, the Inclusive Framework released detailed blueprints on each pillar in October uh, and held a public consultation. They, there were thousands of pages of technical comments um, submitted by stakeholders. Uh, and uh, and so, the, so the work is advancing. Um, th there are significant political issues to be resolved and, and additional technical work to be done. Maybe the most significant open, open question involves the scope of the new rules. Um, in the end, will they be limited to digital activity or will they apply more broadly as has been contemplated to date? Is there a potential for a phased in approach? One that starts with, with digital activity during an initial appear, period and then expands to cover uh, and encompass other types of, of business in later years? There continues to be a to be a question if there's an interest in focusing on, on digital activity. The, the U.S. the U.S. government has been quite vocal, uh, expressing concern about that, and the and the and the difficulty and in in the view of the U.S. government inappropriateness of trying to ring ring fence digital activity 
for a very different form of corporate income taxation than other activity. Um, that, that involves a, a really difficult um, um, uh, definitional issue, because what, what, what is meant by digital activity? Um, certainly we know some, some digital activity, uh, but, but, but every day all businesses are getting um, more and more digital. And so the, the, most, um, the most sort of commodity-like business uh, today has a growing aspect of it, aspect of the business that, 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 that could be viewed as being digital. It's just the nature of the, of the globalization and digitalization of the economy. And so that, that creates challenges in trying sure. to do something that is, that is narrower. I, I think there is um, one, one- I want to bring Sharon in, so, so go ahead and make that last point. I think one outcome could be a high level agreement in principle this summer. Uh, with with plans to continue work uh, on um, uh, to, to to ensure that they that they develop the details of model legislation and model treaty provisions, and I guess I would say that as a final thought, I think it's really important that that a consensus on this that the multilateral activity be grounded in a common understanding of exactly what the rules are to be and how they're to be implemented. Um, because this is this is an effort that requires coordination, not just in the design, but in the in the ongoing implement implementation on a day to day basis. Sure, especially given how fast moving, as you say, many many companies you might not consider them digital now. They're moving in that direction. Sharon, I'd love to get your take on some of those questions uh, that were posed by Barbara and. And uh, I do want to mention to all of those who are following along, if you want to submit questions, please do so. We'd love to, to take one or two in the time remaining. Uh, go ahead, Sharon. So I think Barbara's right about the convergence. You can't ignore the fact that, you know, what's Amazon? Is it a product market? Is it a digital uh, company? What is it? And yet it's explosion amongst the other things of, uh, of profit, um, yet have a look at their tax payment during just the period of the pandemic is extraordinary. So we have to go back to first principles. Should a company pay tax where it's actually earning money? Yes. Should it be uh, that everybody pays a fair share? Yes. We've seen decades of tax lawyers, company lobbyists, uh, you know, look at the illicit flows on uh, on commodity and product markets out of developing countries, this can't go on because we'll never build trust in a world that is governed by, you know, sensible multilateral rules if we don't actually include everybody. And I hear the arguments about revenue versus profit, but I have to tell you I'm a skeptic because I've seen companies manipulate profits. So they'll tell you, they'll move them around till they're making profits in no profits, they say, in a low tax environment. Well, that's got to end. If we're going to have decent companies, and there are many out there having a fair competition floor, then let's, let's actually get it right. So I think Barbara's right. For us, pillar two, I'm not putting words around this bit in your mouth, Barbara, but pillar two on a base corporate tax, ready to go, let's get the rate agreed, let's get it done. Then if we agree on a framework, but not an exclusive framework that does exactly what Barbara says, lets companies fall through the cracks, you know, narrowly taxes digital services that don't include the explosion of online capacity that small companies don't have, so they're forced to use uh, larger company services, making them un unprofitable or uncompetitive themselves. Let's get a shell of principles agreed, a very fast timeline, and let's get it right. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, as we kind of wrap up here, we just have 10 minutes left in the session. I'd love to get some final thoughts uh, from each of you. And maybe, maybe Minister O, oh, you can just speak to what some of the critics would say about the approach that France has taken, right? You, you'll, you'll hear people say that this is onerous, especially in small companies, um, that, that the administering these taxes, ultimately you're gonna pass it on to consumers we saw in the case of Google. Um, you'll hear people say this is going to become a tit for tat approach where countries are simply, you know, pushing and, and there isn't, you're going to actually undermine the, 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 the multilateral approach. And then maybe even innovation gets undermined here because ultimately the taxes are directly targeting the most innovative part of 
the economy. How, how do you think about those challenges that I'm sure you hear and have heard in the debate in France and in the multilateral institutions where you operate? And, and what do you say to them? Well, um, what I would say is that first we have to enter the democratic two questions. The first one is economic, but the main one is, is democratic. And, and I think that has been shared by all the participants. There is a huge democratic pressure to adapt the way our, our taxation system is working to that digital era. And we have to do this. We have the responsibility to do this. Will this hinder competition and innovation? I don't think so. As far as France is concerned, we focused the tax on some, uh, some specific players and we did not decide to reshuffle all the tax system for the digital services tax, but we want to focus on companies that are relying on network effect and all these kind of things and highly digitalized uh, um, uh, players with an important economic footprint, uh, making uh, hundreds of millions of revenue in France. So I don't think that it will hinder competition and hinder innovation uh, for emerging players uh, that can develop without uh, paying the tax. And to make uh, a final uh, a statement and, and to connect with the discussion that we have, I think that we have to fix the, the, the taxation issue, but the taxation issue is, is only the emerged part of the iceberg and the, 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 part, uh, the, the part that we have to solve is the, the way that economy is working, the way um, giant players have emerged uh, with oligopolistic and mono, mono, monopolistic uh, uh, stance and positions. And we have to be able to re-input uh, competition and free market within the way digital uh, market are, are working. This is something that is work on both in the US but also uh, in Europe. And I do think that this is the most uh, important issue that we have to solve from a multilateral point of view, but also within the US and within Europe uh, in the years to come. Thank you, Minister. Maybe I can go to you, Josh, and we just have about a minute each left for, for each of you. Um, what, what do you want to see out of this debate, out of this very fast moving uh, you know, policy change and what worries you? What, what do you think needs to be carefully avoided? Right, well, I, I think um, I, I would just summarize what I've, uh, said in previous comments that we'd really like to see uh, a multilateral solution with all the players at the table leaning into the idea that the the way the economy is now, it, it demands answers to these questions. Uh, we want to avoid, on the flip side, the, the unilateral approaches that, that so many uh, markets are, are, are taking for the reasons I and others have laid out. And then I think a third piece that we haven't talked about yet is just the, the this debate, um, you know, one way to look at it is that it's thinking about tax policy as, as, a, as a stick in a way. Um, and that may be a little bit unfair. Tax policy has an important role to play. But is there a way to look at tax policy potentially as a set of carrots, ways to encourage activity uh, we want to encourage like innovation, like actual physical investments uh, in, in certain markets. I think that that's a conversation that, that Zoom would be very eager to have. Look, we're, we're committed to uh, the, the growth and development of, of, of markets around the world and in working with governments uh, to get there. So um, that's the spirit in which all these comments come out. And we just really want to find creative, coordinated, multilateral ways of getting there. Yeah, that's a great point about the carrot versus the stick and how tax policy can really do both things. Barbara, you spent your career designing tax policy for, with, with those ideas in mind. What are, your, what are your parting thoughts to us as we try to move forward on this digital services tax debate? This is a really important debate uh, and one that um, it is a very positive thing that it's a debate that's happening in the inclusive framework that includes 139 jurisdictions around the world. So it really is a global discussion that that in today's in today's world is essential. Um, I, I think it, it is important that as as these policies are developed, uh, that um, th that there be a commitment to try to ensure that 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 there is a real coordinated agreement so that competing tax policies or overlapping tax policies don't don't become a barrier to, uh, to global trade and investment. And I think it's also to, Im, important to recognize 
the, the costs that are incurred by businesses, particularly uh, related to innovation, uh, and that those costs need to be recognized to so the importance of, a, of an income tax. Uh, and also that, 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 there, that there can be many years of costs before there, before there are profits. And so it is also important not to look just on an annual basis, uh, but to, rec to recognize that that annual period is artificial and the costs that were incurred for many years before need to be, need to be taken into account. So I think all of those things need, need to be part of this, this global discussion. Yeah, that is one of the complexities with uh, especially software businesses and often enterprise software, where you, you know that the future revenue streams are based on a lot of upfront investment and years of losses to get there. And designing tax policy that addresses that does sound like a, a real complexity. Sharon, your, your final thoughts on, on what you're hoping to see us get to as we come out of this. Well, I think, first of all, we've all made it clear the ultimate goal is a multilateral approach that's fair to everybody. And I'll just caution on the, you know, we're big supporters of industry policy, innovation, but I ask you to look at the history. Corporations have taken more and more of the treasury pies in every country for what is actually investment in their own business model to the point where the trust is broken in most countries. And trust in the big tech companies is particularly broken because of the explosion of profit versus the, the taxation they're paying, or in fact, the wages they're paying, uh, you know, in the case of some of the big corporates uh, or the respect for freedom of association, particularly Amazon and the like. But I just want to finish by saying I support Minister O entirely. If you can't get action on a global stage initially, you have to do something in your own country to retain and build trust. And if you can't, uh, if you can make that conditional, indeed on a block like the EU, and I would say we totally support the EU developing rules, America will develop rules and I'd support our unions and other actors saying in the absence of a multilateral approach, that's logical. And it's also important because no one's touched on the geopolitical power. But if you look at uh, countries like China using, you know, tech uh, development and governance and the trade wars that are, that's eliciting, then we need to actually make sure there are regional blocks, big national company blocks, whatever it takes in order to negotiate a settlement. But let's see, if we can do it through the OECD, let's make that happen. The G20 adding to that, let's make that happen. But I totally understand governments because people will demand it and that's democracy. And indeed groups like the EU, the US, et cetera, actually building a base because citizens are demanding it, trust is broken and frankly our democracies will demand uh, the same. And finally, can I say we support the companies that are not lobbying in their own interest. There are too many still lobbying to evade tax rather than indeed to pay a fair share. And that's where we want to see the end game. Well, thank you for that, Sharon. I think you really helped to wrap up and bring us full circle in a way. Um, you know, Cedric, Minister Cedric O said at the beginning that uh, this is really a question of democracy and what people want. You talked about the issue of trust. In some senses, it's a very technical conversation for those of you following along around the world about you know, how precisely do we target digital companies? How do you define them? What's the appropriate way to tax them? How to make it work multilaterally? But it's also a fundamentally political and democratic question, as you just say, Sharon, it is about trust. And when that trust has been broken, it makes this job that much harder and the promise of a multilateral approach that much greater if we can actually get there. So I wanna thank all of you for a really fascinating discussion, for an ambitious discussion, I think. Um, and thank all of you who've joined us from around the world. So again, my, my thanks to um, Minister Cedric O, oh, to Josh Calmer, to uh, Barbara Angus and to Sharon Burrow. Thank you so much for a great discussion. And I wanna bring in now, if, if I can, Sean Doherty, who is the head of international trade and investment at the World Economic Forum, just to, to, to take us out of this session to talk about the next steps from here. Great, thanks a lot, Raj. Really, I just wanted to, on behalf of the World Economic Forum, thank you and all of the panelists for really a great conversation. Uh, the forum's multi-stakeholder community We'll be exploring this topic in some depth over the, the coming months. And I think this discussion has really been a great way to get us uh, started off into the next phase. So what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at how digital services taxes and other uh, tax policy changes are affecting digital trade, are affecting companies' business models and competition and uh, inclusion as well. 
So what we hope to do is to be able to advise on how to make uh, policy more effective and more coherent and connect, importantly, between tax policy, between trade policy, antitrust policy and more. So I do invite everybody who's joined uh, the session today to please do get in touch with our, our trade team. If you'd like to contribute, we'd love to hear from you. And again, thank you very much to our moderator, to our panelists and to the audience today. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.